name is Louis Adolf Reb, R-A-B-B. I know everybody asked them, but my father nicknamed all of his boys. But he just happened to nickname me Mike, and it stuck. Everybody calls me Mike Reb. No, no, they were not rich. <laughs> As a matter of fact, a lot of people who saw all those sisters together with the fine clothes, but that's the way they dressed. My father packed me up and had men working for him take me down to the train in a little town in Columbus, Mississippi, and they stayed on the train until they got picked up enough speed and they jumped off. I cried all the time the first year. They put me in Thrasher Hall, which was a little boy's dormitory, way up on the third floor, where they had pine straw mattresses for you to sleep on. But it just happened that there was a person from my hometown, I didn't know him. He was the captain of the football team. So he had them bring me down to him in our room with him during my first year. Told my brother, I got I got I finished high school for you. Not for me. He said, but Mike, it's important for you to go you got to go to college. I said, Maurice, I don't want to go to college. So he just insisted that I try for one year. At that time they gave you a two year certificate in college. And I said, all right, I'll I'll, I'll sign up for the two years. And when that was up, uh, I, was, I was finished. He said, Mike, now it wasn't so bad. Now, why don't you just stay here and finish college? So I said, oh, Maurice, all right, I'll stay here for you. And I stayed here and I finished college. But when I finished college, the, the, the new president had just been elected to replace Dr. Moten. Dr. Robert R. Moden, who was the second president of Tuskegee. So I needed a job. This was back in the, the, during the Depression. And I didn't know where I, was going, where I was going to land if I didn't have a job. So I went to Dr. Patterson, and he gave me a job across the street in the cafeteria, which had just been started. But when I got over there, the, the manager found out that I had graduated in business administration. So he made me his assistant. But when I first came to Tuskegee, I met Dr. Carver. I didn't know who he was. I was walking from now in the Carver Museum, which was the student laundry. And he stopped me as I was walking up the, walking up the walk. He said, young man, do you know what kind of tree this is? I looked up here, looked and looked, oh, I don't know. Started to walk away, he grabbed me. And he reprimanded me for not knowing that that was an oak tree. I still didn't know who he was. He looked like a bum. After I, he released me, and I started to walk away. And the young man said, boy, do you know who that was you were talking to? I said, no. He said, that was Dr. Carver. I said, well, who is this? And I said, well, who in the hell is Dr. Carver? I don't know a thing about him. But, but that's the way I met him. But I found out that he was a very important man. When they came to the cafeteria, they had a walk-in refrigerator with all the stuff hanging up, you see. So it was my job to take Dr. Carver around to let him go in the walk-in refrigerator to cut fat meat off of, his, off of the carcasses for him to take over to his dormitory. He got to the point where he, where he couldn't do anything. And eventually the, the school brought him from the dormitory to Dorothy Hall. That's where he died. Dr. Patterson transferred me after the first year to the labor office. And in those days, all students had to work. There was no paying your way through. Of course, you only had a half a dozen people who could pay their way through, but they had to work. So my job was to give jobs to students. 
But he said, Rev, you're doing a nice job over there for us as Secretary of Labor. He says, we are sending you to Columbia to get your master's degree in personnel work. That's just to strengthen me to be able to do a better job in the labor office. I was surprised because when I thought when he called me, he was going to fire me. And he told me, he said, Mike, I want you to transfer to the hospital. I said, well, I don't know if he's in the hospital. He said, well, just go over there part time. And you can, if you don't like it, you can continue to give jobs to students. I told you all of the students had to work. Well, I went over there, but I liked it over there. I was head of the business office. That's all I was doing. It was Dr. Kenneth's last year at Tuskegee. He had been here. He was Booker T. Washington's private physician. But he'd been away and come back and maybe he was going back again. You know, the Klan ran him out the first time. I don't know if you know that or not. But, uh, so I enjoyed it over there. I enjoyed working with Dr. Kenny. And when, uh, well, when he left, uh, the school called me up again. I've been over in the business, working in the business office for two or three years. Basil O'Connor was chairman of the board, board of trustees, and they told Mr. O'Connor that they wanted to expand the hospital program. And Mr. O'Connor said he would not approve it unless they had a hospital administrator. So they called me up and said, we are sending you away to get your master's degree in hospital administration. So I applied to the schools that are offering it. So they told me, he said, apply to all of them and see if you can get in. Well, I applied and I was accepted by all of them. So um, I chose Northwestern because of its program, Hospital Organization and Management. Bachelor's degree in Tuskegee in Business Administration. I have a master's degree from Columbia in personnel work. And I have a master in hospital administration from Northwestern University. So I have three degrees. We gave all the services to anyone who came. But we had a big OB program and uh, we didn't have any money for it. So when the people came, we took them. And you had a lot of people. I think when I was left the hospital, we had patients to come to the hospital from 34 of the 67 counties. That shows you that we took them from everywhere. And uh, Tuskegee just couldn't afford to subsidize the hospital under those circumstances. So eventually, it closed. I wasn't over there at the time. I had been transferred to the president's office as assistant to Dr. Forster, who, who replaced Dr. Patterson. But during, I told you during the early days, this was a dry county, you could get no whiskey. So I had met a, several guys we used to we used to get together every weekend just to just to drink. We would sit down and talk and everything and we would drink beer. So one of the guys said, uh, why don't we why don't we form a poker club? I didn't know what he was talking about. I never played poker, didn't know anything about it. It was about a half a dozen of us. But they were all PhDs, you know, and they knew about poker. From that time on, we formed the poker club. And we've been playing poker since 1945. I really can't think of things, anything with that, that, that we do now that we didn't do when we started. We only drank beer around, and we never drank whiskey, and we still don't. My father died when I first came to Tuskegee. My mother died, and all of them 
my brothers are dead. And let the students off, and all the old students would go down and look to see who was coming in. And I always remember the first time I, I met my wife to be. All the students would get off the train, stand around and talk, and then after a while she got off and she walked right on through the crowd and walked right on up towards the Sage Hall going to Whitehall to register. And my eyes followed her from the time she got off that plane, off that train, all the way up to Sage, past Sage Hall, as far as I could see. But during the time she was in college, uh, she told people, I'm going to marry my grab. Didn't say anything to me about it, but she just said, I'm going to marry my grab. And, uh, and of course, we did get married. So we, we were together for over, over 65 years. It was difficult for me. It was difficult. I remember when my wife was in the bed, I used to call Velma Bray to come over to look at her. And um, she came over and she put a stethoscope to my wife and she immediately removed it. And she said, Mike, she's dying. That hurt. That hurt. So we got together and got her by, uh, got her transported to the East Alabama Medical Center where she died in the emergency room. That was difficult for me. And I have been single ever since then. My wife had died and my daughter had died and I was left with everything you see. But when my wife was living, she made all of the changes. She bought everything for the house, all of the wallpaper and everything. And uh, of course, I always supported her in anything she wanted to do. So we had a good life together, though. We had one daughter, Marsha, and she went to Tennessee State to get a master's degree. And after that, she, she moved to Buffalo, New York, where she worked. She had colon cancer. Oh, I drive. I'm, I'm fortunate. <laughs> Can drive. I've, I've, I've been driving other people to the doctors, and a lot of them, a lot of them have died, like Gene Carver, Ed Price, a lot of people. Well, I've been lucky. That's all I say. I've tried to do everything that I should do, and apparently I have, and I've, uh, I've just, just tried to live a good life. Now, all you have to do is just remember. To wake up every morning. Yeah, I see my wife is buried here, mm -hmm. and, uh, but a lot of my friends are all along here. Uh, and all of these plots were were, 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 were were vacant. The president of Tuskegee had bought some, but when I found out, I ordered about. About, about 15 of them, and I paid for them, all the guys gave me the money back. Mm -hmm. But all of these are my friends. All of these people, from the corner all the way down to that right there. But this is my wife and me there. As my daughter told me one time, she said, Daddy, everybody dies. And she was right. So, so I just made a place for myself and my wife.